Thank you so much for watching It Is Written. We are in the fifth part of a series on a subject that touches almost every family in the world. It is a subject that is not often talked about because sometimes people feel ashamed or, or embarrassed by the subject, and that is the subject of depression. But there's nothing to be embarrassed about. There's nothing to be ashamed of because what we have been finding is that there is a way out. And beyond just discussing depression, we have been discussing principles that can help every single individual have better thinking skills and have a more healthy lifestyle. And I am absolutely thrilled to have with me in studio Dr. Neil Nedley. Dr. Nedley, thank you again for joining us on It Is Written. It's great to be here, Chris. I've enjoyed it. Dr. Nedley, we have been discussing this issue of mental health and depression. And just as a point of review, this is the second part of two of the series on stress and anxiety. Actually, this is stress without distress. Yes. So maybe just as a review, what is stress? What is anxiety? What's the difference? Well, stress is our response to stressors. So we have things from the outside that can cause us to feel stressed and actually whether we say we're stressed or not has a lot to do with our coping mechanisms. And so that's our response. Okay. And then anxiety is what as we talk about stress? Anxiety is when stress gets out of control. So that's when you start getting symptoms of um, tingling. You might get symptoms where you feel like your thoughts are racing um, and you have trouble sleeping even because your thoughts are continually going. And uh, you just feel on edge. And so that's more than just stress when you're feeling on edge. That's when it gets to anxiety. Okay. And then how do those both relate to depression? Well, they are related in that when we're not coping adequately with stress, we're more likely to experience depression. But also, most people with depression have a component of anxiety and okay. vice versa. Okay. And so often there's an overlap of these three things. Okay. And we've been talking about this. The whole idea of stress without distress is that we don't often want to eliminate the stress. Correct. Because stress can actually be good for us. That's right. We talked about how it can be last time. Okay. And, you know, if you happened to miss the show on stress without distress, you can go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash IIW Canada, and there you can watch the whole series and you can get the first part of this stress without distress. But Dr. Nedley, so some stress is good. Yes. And instead of eliminating stress, what we've been talking about is how to cope yes. or deal with stress. Exactly. And we were ending our discussion in the last show on ways that are probably not the best in dealing with stress. That's right. Okay. And the, where we ended, and I know it kept a lot of people on edge, uh, <laughs> hopefully not anxiety, but on edge. Right. We ended on the, we don't want to be using some of the legal drugs. Correct. Why don't we unpack that a little bit? What, what do you, when we say legal drugs, what are we referring to as far as categories of legal drugs? Well, uh, alcohol is a legal drug. Okay. And a lot of people turn to alcohol as a coping resource, so okay. to speak. Okay. And then what's another one? Well, uh, marijuana is becoming legal. I don't know how it is in Canada, but <laughs> in the U.S., there's a lot of states that have legalized it, and a lot of people will turn to marijuana. Okay. So I have, I have heard many people say that alcohol actually is a de-stressor. You know, come home, have a little glass of wine, come home and have a little mixed drink, and it actually de-stresses me. How, how do we, if it, but you're saying it actually is not a stress reliever. What actually happens when we're intaking alcohol and using it as a stress reliever? Well, the first thing that alcohol does is it suppresses the frontal lobe of the brain. And so that means our judgment can be off. Okay. Now, we're going to back up a little bit just in case somebody's just tuning in and they haven't been watching. All. You use this word frontal lobe. Yeah. What are you referring to when you say the frontal lobe? Well, the front portion of our brain is the seat of spirituality, morality, and the will. It's where our decisions are made. 
It's also the analytical portion of our brain where we analyze things and have hopefully good judgment in making a wise decision. Okay, and so if I partake of alcohol, if I drink alcohol, and I've understood if I just have one drink of alcohol, it already begins to lower the function of my frontal lobe. That's right. And once that's lowered, it's lowering my judgment and I'm losing my ability to cope or deal with stress, actually. Yeah, actually. Uh, now, a lot of people like the relaxation part of things. And of course, when you drink more, not just one drink, one drink really isn't going to relax you. It's going to suppress your frontal lobe and you're going to think you have all of your functions in place, even though your critical thinking and your willpower is down. Uh, but a lot of people drink it to actually have the sedative effect and that's when their cerebellum starts being affected and their coordination is way off and uh, at this point they're pretty much out of control of themselves and uh, that's no way to cope with stress yes you know, it might numb some emotional pain yes but it's gonna complicate things in the long run yes and I have found from my own personal experience, uh, before I came into a living and active relationship with Jesus, I, I found uh, I used to use alcohol as a coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. And here's the interesting thing. You would part I would partake of alcohol, mm -hmm. and I would feel better for a moment. Mm -hmm. But then when I would come back to the right state of mind, first, my problems hadn't disappeared. They were right. still there. And yeah. oftentimes they were even worse now because of the fact that I had done that. That's right. So alcohol is not going to help us deal with stress. Yeah, and then you had to deal with a hangover if you <laughs> overdid it as well. <laughs> That's you know, right. So now you have a headache and all of those other things. Yeah, so we've got a whole other things, to, a whole other group of things that we need to deal with. Now, you, you mentioned marijuana. We're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about marijuana in a, in a show that will come much later after this series on okay. overcoming addictions. Mm -hmm. But let, let's just briefly address the issue of marijuana. Why is marijuana not going to be a good de-stressor? Well, marijuana is going to decrease your motivational ability to achieve your goals. Okay. And it also actually lowers IQ. So it's actually lowering your analytical ability. In fact, the largest study done on marijuana in the National Academy of Sciences shows that the more it's used and the longer it's used, it actually can permanently lower your IQ as well as particularly the motivational component of emotional intelligence. Hmm. And with coping adequately with stress, we want to have a good brain. Yes. And we also want to have motivation. Okay. What's this thing of decreasing motivation? In fact, what happens with these marijuana users is their motivation for just about everything in life goes down except for the pursuit of marijuana. Uh, and they'll go through all sorts of hoops to try to get their medical card in California so they can legally use it and all of those sorts of things. But in reality, the things that used to be of personal relevance and interest to them have diminished. Wow, wow. Now. There are other legal drugs, and we, we touched on them in the last show, nicotine. Mm -hmm. A lot of people smoke to de-stress. Mm -hmm. Makes me feel better, de-stress. What, what's happening with nicotine? Is nicotine a good way to deal with stress? Well, nicotine in low doses is a stimulant, and in higher doses, it's a suppressant. Okay. And it also has a subtle effect, not as much as alcohol or marijuana, on depressing the frontal lobe of the brain. So again, not a good choice. Not a good choice. Yeah. Now, where we left, and this is where people might be on edge, is you mentioned the C word. <laughs> Caffeine. Yeah. A lot of Canadians, a lot of Americans, a lot yeah. of people around the world yeah. deal with their stress. Every morning they wake up and they have that cup of coffee to prepare them for the day. Right. Let's talk about caffeine. How is caffeine going to affect our stress, our anxiety? Is it going to help us cope? Well, caffeine is not going to help us cope. Yeah, anxiety-wise, it's going to increase it. Wow. And so it makes our stress go more into anxiety. It is a stimulant, so it's going to try to rev things up. But at the same time it's stimulating you, it's suppressing, blocking the adenosine receptors in the frontal lobe. Pavlov studied this out. Typists can type a little bit faster under the influence of caffeine, but they make 10 times as many errors. And so it does have a, a suppressant effect as well, even in regards to gossip. 
they studied gossip, and in order to study it, you have to define it. So gossip was defined as sharing private information with someone who's not part of the problem or part of the solution to the mm. problem. And when people had caffeine on board, they were much more likely to gossip wow. than when they didn't have caffeine on board. And that's not going to help your stress when your close associates find out what you've been saying about them. Yeah, <laughs> yes. So caffeine's not going to help us cope. Nicotine's not going to help us cope. Alcohol's not going to help us cope. Uh, legalized, er, legalized marijuana, not going to help us cope. Uh, illegal marijuana, not going to help us cope. What about prescription medications? Are there any prescription medications that are going to help us cope with stress? Well, that's a good question. The most commonly used ones for anxiety and stress are going to make us feel better, but they're not going to help us cope better. Okay. And there's a difference between actually feeling better and getting better. And these drugs uh, actually have somewhat of an alcohol-like effect. You know, um, Xanax, Ativan, you know, it's kind of the, the high-class alcoholics, uh, so to speak, uh, in that they still get kind of a little buzz off of it. They feel good. They feel, you know, a little sedated. Uh, but in reality, their frontal lobe is suppressed, mm. and it's not going to seriously help them as far as coping. We want things that are going to enhance the frontal lobe of the brain to really get the correct coping mechanisms there. And then we'll not only get better, but of course we'll feel better when we get better. And that is actually the root of what we've been talking about for these five shows. We don't want to just feel better, but we actually want to get to the root of the issue, take care of the problem so that we actually are better, and by being better, then we feel better. Exactly. Now, let's talk about some ways to cope with stress. Socially, are there any ways, socially speaking, that we can cope with stress? We, we've, 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 for the viewer there, we've taken everything away, so to speak. <laughs> so now let's provide some practical, practical steps. Socially, or from a social perspective, are there ways for us to deal with stress? Well, we don't want to socially isolate. Okay. And this is what happens sometimes when people feel too stressed out. They just want to, you know, come into some, you know, secluded place. And in reality, yeah, we have to sleep at night, and that's the time to, sure. to be secluded <laughs> yes. and get appropriate sleep, which is very important, by the way, of coping adequately with stress. Uh, but we don't want to disconnect socially. We're social creatures, and we want to actually build on our social relationships. And part of that is just building on the positive social relationships, being positive about the people in our lives. Okay. Uh, actually uh, not only befriending them, but being positive. And if you have negative people surrounding you all of the time, um, it pays a toll on you. And the way to turn them from being negative is you being positive and not being negative yourself. And at first they might be a little offended by that because a lot of people, you know, they kind of feed off of this negativity. Yes. But uh, it, it actually works well to become the change agent on being a more positive person. Okay, wow, so that's a lot there in a, in, a, in a few short sentences. So first way of coping with stress is get enough sleep, okay? Mm -hmm. how, how, much, how much sleep should we be getting? Seven to eight hours is ideal. Okay. Um, no more than nine. No more than nine. If you're an adult. Okay. And no less than six. And no so less that's than the six. Range. Yeah. Okay. But ideally around seven to eight, and we've already mm -hmm. talked about this in previous shows, early to bed, Early to rise. Gives a significant advantage on thinking positively, actually. They're calling it the new Prozac. The new Prozac. <laughs> so getting enough sleep, early to bed, early to rise. The new Prozac. Mm -hmm. Being a positive person. And we become a better positive person by getting enough sleep. Mm -hmm. We've talked about how to change our thinking, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Don't isolate ourselves. So putting that in a, pro a positive sense, being around people and being around positive people, mm -hmm. and if we happen to be around negative people, being a change agent to become, help that group become positive. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Now, mentally speaking, what are some ways that we can combat anxiety and stress mentally? Well, when we're confronted with a problem that is stressful, it's good to not turn it into two problems. Okay. Normally when a problem comes our way, we not only have the practical problem, and by the way, I should back up. It's not really a practical problem unless it inhibits you 
from achieving your goals. Okay. And a lot of people get bent out of shape about ideas of this or that, but when they actually look at it, it's not inhibiting them from achieving their goals. Let's not spend a lot of our time and resources and mental, you know, anxiety yes. over really imagine problems because an imagined problem is a problem that we see as a problem but it's not really adversely affecting our ability to achieve our goals okay so if it is really a practical problem normally there's an emotional problem that comes along with it okay because we are frustrated our goals are being threatened and so we tend to have this sometimes very large emotional reaction to practical problems mm -hmm which actually inhibits us from dealing with the practical okay. problem. And so what I tell my clients is simply this. When you have a practical problem, let's just turn it into one problem instead of two. Uh, we always deal better with the least amount of problems that we have. Yes. And how we do that is to recognize, you know, I'm going to have this problem whether I'm miserable about it or not, so I'm going to choose to give up the misery. Okay. What does that do? It helps you to feel calmer, and it also puts you in a position to be able to do something more useful about your practical problem so that your goals ultimately are not adversely affected. So we give up the misery. That's right. You know, it reminds me actually of a Bible verse, Romans 8, 18, where Paul writes, for I reckon that our sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. And so we just give up that misery and we decide that we're not going to be miserable about it and we are able then to deal with one problem rather than two. You know, I had one client that was so upset about his car breaking down. You know, when, you're, when your car breaks down your way to work, that does inhibit you. It is a practical problem. Yes. It inhibits you from achieving your goals. You want to be able to work. And uh, this car had broken down several times, and now it was breaking down again on his way to work. And he got so angry about it, he took out a gun and he shot his car. Now, <laughs> pretty serious. The, the car doesn't care whether you're miserable about it or not. I mean, what did that do? That actually complicated it even worse. Yes. And so once he learned this technique, it was wonderful. What a difference it made when he realized, you know what, I don't have to have an emotional reaction to these practical problems. I need to recognize I'm going to be mis I'm going to not be miserable, but I'm going to have this problem whether I'm miserable about it or not. So let me give up the misery and then he was able to actually get his car fixed permanently and not have it threaten him like that. Very, very good. Now, any other coping mechanisms? And let's, let's get, this, is, this program is called It Is Written. Does the Bible say anything about coping with stress? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. In fact, the Bible gives some role models as well. Uh, but some of the principles in the Bible, yes. um, you know, uh, in Matthew, the great Sermon on the Mount, Christ said, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Yes. Now, uh, he also said to plan appropriately who is going to build a tower without considering the costs. So once we plan appropriately and we have order and organization in our life, which are two very important principles in coping adequately with stress, yes. worrying about the results is something that's just going to get into our way. Okay. And so, uh, and that's what he condemns. And so once we plan appropriately, we have order or organization in our life, worrying about the results is going to actually in hinder our ability to achieve our goals. Okay. So we talk about the Bible. Can spirituality, can, can spiritual health help in dealing with stress and anxiety? Absolutely. Yeah, because the frontal lobe is the seat of spirituality, morality, and the will, when we read spiritual themes, we're actually building up our resilience. Okay. And so reading the Bible, reading Psalms and Proverbs and Daniel actually can help our frontal lobe function. Okay. Now, there will be some people that talk about meditating on the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's talk about this issue of meditation just a little bit. Meditating on the scriptures, what does it mean to meditate on the scriptures? How does that healthy meditation on scriptures look? Well, the healthiest forms of meditation involve the frontal lobe where we're actually analyzing things. 
the unhealthy meditations will be like a Xanax. They make us feel better, maybe feel at oneness with the universe or whatever, but in reality they suppress the frontal lobe through self-hypnotic techniques. So meditating on the word is not only being mindful of what the word says, but analyzing a little bit and actually putting it into our frontal lobe and not only just repeating it so that we might be able to learn the concept, but maybe doing a comparison. Where else are these words mentioned in scripture? Mm -hmm. Where else can, well, let's look at the opposite of that. Was the opposite of that mentioned in scripture and is it condemned or not? Mm -hmm. And when we get into that type of analytical meditation on the word, our frontal lobe is starting to gear up and we're gonna learn some things that will help us cope with stress. Studying the word, studying the Bible, Mm -hmm. through analyzing it, mm -hmm. looking deeply in it, that's mm -hmm. going to help us cope with stress. It will. Okay. Meditating in a way where we empty ourselves, uh, where we uh, get into self-hypnotic techniques is mm -hmm. actually not going to help us and probably make us even more stressed. Am I hearing you correctly on that? Well, what it does is it makes people actually feel better. The, the meditation technique, it's almost like you know, they're, they're in theta waves even though they're awake, so that's like stage two sleep. Okay. Uh, once they learn how to meditate well. Mm -hmm. um, and so they think, oh wow, I have a whole lot less stress now. I'm not feeling it, I'm feeling better. But in reality, they haven't done anything practical to help them cope with the stressors in their life. Uh, other than disassociate themselves from those stressors, in the meditation technique that they're utilizing. And so we're not talking about disassociating with stressors or disassociating ourselves from reality, mm -hmm. which is what the Eastern meditation techniques are about. We're talking about actually building up our strength, our resiliency, our mental forces, so that we can deal with the practical problems in our life in a healthy way and actually grow from it. And so practical steps to deal with stress, get enough sleep, not multiply the problem, deal with one problem, uh, don't use uh, legal or illegal drugs to deal with it, and then spend some time meditating on God's Word, along with some of the other things we've talked about, right diet, optimal nutrition, and all of these things, exercise and someone will be able to deal with their stress. And as they read the word, looking at, and I think I heard you say, the Psalms and the Proverbs. Yes. So, you know, and it's... You know, a prayer is also another good meditation technique that involves the frontal lobe. Well, you know, Dr. Nedley, that is perfect timing because we are out of time. So why don't we end with prayer? And if you could have prayer for us and offer up a prayer to help us maybe cope with our stress today. Sure, I'd be glad to. Thank you. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are interested in our health of body, mind, and soul, and that you desire us to be able to cope with the stressors that come our way, not only so that we can live healthier and happier, but also that we can be a more effective change agent in helping the world to become a better place. We thank you for your willingness to help us in all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.